Uh, welcome back, everyone, to the uh, NYU Undergrad uh, Math Colloquium. Uh, we have Andre here with us for the fifth session of the Math of the Cell. Uh, so I'm going to let him continue. Thanks. Uh, for some reason, there we go. Okay, my slides are acting up. So, uh, hi, everyone. Hi, Ming Shen and Giancarlo. If you could turn your cameras on, that would be great, just so I can see you. Nothing like having RSVPs and then half the people who RSVP don't come. <laughs> so, but here we are. I'm glad you're here. So, um, today I, I'm basically, I decided that the last two weeks I'm just going to talk about my own research. And this week I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my undergrad capstone. So, this was some work I did with the immersed boundary method, which we talked about last time. And Meng Zhan knows well, Giancarlo does not, which is fine, we will review it. So just jump in if you have questions, okay? Giancarlo, how was the exam? Oh, come on, man. I'm sure it was fine. All right, anyway. So let's just, without further ado, let's jump right in. Come on, okay. So I'm gonna talk about the immersed boundary method, and then I'm gonna talk about what we changed in the immersed boundary method. And then I'm gonna talk about applications. Have you ever went to a talk and somebody spent like 10 minutes talking about their outline? Like I'm going to talk about this, and then I'm going to talk about this. Oh, and before I do that, I'm going to address this, this, this. And it's like, come on, man, just get to the talk. So let's do it. So you, you, Giancarlo, right? Did you talk about this example? The Tacoma Narrows Bridge. The Tacoma Narrows Bridge is the the the, uh, the classic example of something that you've talked about a million times in ODEs. No, I never heard of it. Okay, but it starts with an R and you've talked about it a million times in ODEs. It's when the natural frequency of the system- Resonance. Resonance, resonance yeah. So this disaster here, what happened was there's this bridge and it like would wave in the wind sometimes. And most of the time it was pretty harmless because it would start oscillating, but the oscillations would be damped, which is fine. And, but there was a time when it started to oscillate at its natural frequency. So what happens when it starts oscillating at its natural frequency, Giancarlo, as time goes to infinity, If it's forced, sorry, if it's forced at its natural frequency, as time goes to infinity, what happens to the solution? It, it goes on forever. Right? Does it get bigger or smaller? Bigger. Bigger. So what happened here was the system started to be forced at its natural frequency by the wind, and the oscillations got bigger and bigger until the bridge just blew up like that, like in this picture. And um, you can Google it, it's on Wikipedia. But part of the reason this happened was the engineers didn't properly account for the fluid structure interaction between the air and the bridge. So does anybody know who this is? Michael Phelps. Huh? Michael Phelps. No, that is me. Oh. <laughs> That's me swimming in college. There's actually a story about this picture was that on senior day, we had, um, we had, everybody had pictures of them on the board, right? On senior day, like when we would walk out and there were no pictures of me. She had literally, my coach had no pictures of me on file. So we had to take this picture and practice and pretend like it was a me. 
And another example of fluid structure interaction is when you have red blood cells in a tube. So just like your blood vessels, here you're gonna have red blood cells flowing in a tube, but the tube is, is you, there's no flow on the walls. So what happens is that the velocity in the middle, I wanna use the, uh, the thing, spotlight. Work. Oh, there it is. Okay. So, can you see my spotlight now? My red thing? So, the velocity in the middle of the tube is bigger than the velocity on the outside of the tube. That's zero. And so, what you get is that the, the red blood cell flows more this way than it does on the sides, and it makes this parachute shape. So, our, our main goal was to study something called, or my advisor's goal at the time, something called cellular blebbing. And I'm gonna to get to what that is. So governing equations, right? Giancarlo, were you here when we talked about fluid mechanics? Yeah. Okay. So the second lecture, we talked about fluid mechanics. And, um, we talked about how the fluid that surrounds the cell obeys the Navier-Stokes equations, this equation here, and then the incompressibility condition. And that equation is coupled to an equation for the structure. Here, I'm assuming that the structure is just a, a line. So let's think about the structure as basically a rubber band. So what happens is, you define the rubber band and you define a constitutive law for the rubber band. So in this equation here, what I'm saying is that the force is some kind of tension, okay, times a normal vector, the normal vector. So here, the normal vector points this way, that's the inward normal. So, I'll show you an example. Let's say we have a rubber band and it's stretched out like it's stretched out like this. So like it's stretched into an oval when it's supposed to be a circle. So the normal vector here is this way. The normal vector here is this way. And here, the normal vector is in, you think it's inward, but the tension here, there's going to be a negative tension. Because here, here, we're, or I'm sorry, it's going to be, yeah, here it's going to be a, a certain sign in the tension so that it points out because here the membrane is stretched. Here the membrane is actually compressed a little bit. So you get a force, basically you get a force that's outward here on the top and bottom and inward on the left and right. So basically all you need to know is that for this rubber band, the force is designed to return it to its circular configuration from any deformation. Is that clear? Okay. So I talked about this when we talked about fluid mechanics, which is that when you rescale the fluid equation, when you rescale the Navier-Stokes equation, in front of this whole term here, you get something called the Reynolds number. And so when the Reynolds number is much less than one, that term here is completely insignificant. You can get rid of it. And what you get is you get the Stokes equations. You get these Stokes equations here, which is a simplified momentum balance. And then you get the incompressibility condition and you still have the same equation for the rubber band. So now you have the equations. You know that this is the equation that governs the fluid. And then inside the force on the fluid is governed by the force on the rubber band. And so how do you solve this? And I, I talked about this last time with uh, Meng Zhan is that there's a variety of solution methods. So the, the immersed boundary method, which I'm gonna talk about today, is a solution method. 
And it's actually a very, a very simple method because it's easy to understand for undergrads like yourselves. But it's not the best method for modeling selves. And the reason it's not the best method is because these equations are linear. They're linear PDEs. And it turns out that whenever you have a linear PDE, most of the time, and for Stokes equations included, you can actually write down the solution analytically. So you can actually write down here, that's what this equation is right here. First, the first thing that you do, okay, is you take the Stokes equation, this, and on the right side, you put a delta function forcing. So you say, what would happen if I just had a point force? What would the solution be to the Stokes equation? And you call that G, all right? So now let's imagine that you had multiple point forces. Okay, forget about boundary conditions. If an, o, let's think about ODs, okay? Giancarlo, because I'm picking on Giancarlo because he's in my ODE class. So Giancarlo, if you have an ODE, okay? And on the right side, you have a sum of two, for, two forces, F1 and F2, right? I know the solution if it's just F1, and I know the solution if it's just F2. If it's a linear ODE, and I put F1 and F2 together on the right-hand side, how would I get a solution for both of them? I can write this out. I'll write it out for you so you see what I mean. Can you see my writing? Yes? A linear combination. Good, that's right, right? So if you have this ODE, and then you have the same ODE, where's my, what happened to my mouse? Oh, what the heck, okay, here we go. Oh. If you have this ODE, And then you have the same OD, but you replace everything by two. The solution to F1 plus F2 on the right side is just Y1 plus Y2. So here, if you take a PDE, you stick a point force in the fluid at multiple locations. And G is the solution for one point force. Then the solution is just the sum of Gs, the sum of those Gs for the different point forces. And then what you do is you say, okay, well, when I have a surface, I don't have just a sum of point forces. I actually have a continuous curve of point forces. So you replace the sum that you would have with an integral. And that gives you the solution. You can actually write it down as an integral of the Green's function this is what we call G, the Green's function, times the force density on the elastic structure. So what that means is that you can actually write the solution. I know the solution for the fluid velocity anywhere in the fluid. So that's, in my opinion, that's a better way to solve these problems than the, problem, than the, than the method I'm gonna tell you about today. And we're going to talk about why that is. Notice here, okay, gamma is the curve. Okay, gamma is the structure, this thing. Right here. So the solution here for the velocity anywhere in the fluid can be written down in terms of integrals over gamma. Okay, so let's talk, let's think about this. If I have a cell 
let's say I have a rubber band. Look at this drawing here. What's the dimension of gamma? Ming Zhang, how many dimensions is gamma here? Um, there's only one. The one dimensional curve. Okay. How many dimensions is the fluid domain? Um, two. It's a two dimensional domain. Okay. So in the method I'm about to tell you about, you have to discretize the entire fluid domain. Have you, by the way, have you heard of this stuff, Meng Zhang, boundary integral methods? Uh, yeah. Okay. So in the method I'm about to tell you about, you have to discretize the entire fluid domain. That's a 2D discretization. Whereas if you just have an integral over the surface, you just have to discretize the curve that you're integrating over. You just integrate this numerically. That's a 1D integral. So you reduce your problem from two dimensions to one. When we go from to three dimensions, it's the same thing. You, you can reduce the problem from three dimensions for the fluid to two dimensions, which is basically the dimension of the cell surface. But again, I'm not going to talk about that today. Today I'm going to talk about a different method, which is the immersed boundary method. Okay, so anybody know this guy? Meng Zhang does. He's actually a professor at NYU. I would tell you where his office is, but who cares, right? Because we never go in the building anymore. So. So I don't know how you would see him. It's fun, like when you see famous people in the hallway, right? Like someday there's going to be somebody at Quran who probably solves the Navier Stokes Millennium Prize problem and gets a million dollars. And when they do that, probably it'll be after we're all graduated. But when they do that, the students at NYU will say, oh my God, I saw Vlad Nicole in the hallway. He's the one who got the million dollars. There's a good movie about that that just came out called um, Gifted. I mentioned it at the one seminar, the Fluid Dynamics Seminar. But Gifted, good movie. Okay, so here's the thing. Here's how the immersed boundary method works, okay? You take your fluid domain, you chop it up into pieces, right? By drawing these boxes. So each of these blue points is a grid point in the Eulerian, what we call the Eulerian fluid domain. Okay, so this, each blue point is a point in the fluid that you are going to represent as a, on the grid. It's because the discretized fluid domain. Each of these white circles or this black circle is a Lagrangian point. It's a point on the structure that you're going to keep track of. So what you're going to do is you want to keep track of these points on the structure as they move. But the fluid points, you keep them fixed. You don't move them. You just keep track of velocity, pressure, the fluid variables at those Eulerian points. We talked about, remember, Eulerian versus Lagrangian. Eulerian is when the sensor is fixed and you're tracking the temperature. Lagrangian is when you tie the sensor to a balloon and the balloon floats around. So that's what this is. The Lagrangian is on the structure. The structure moves around and you keep track of that point. Eulerian is the sensors are fixed and you're keeping track of velocities. Is that clear? I know Meng Zhang knows this. Giancarlo you want, or Carolina, you want to ask any questions? I can see you doing something, Giancarlo. I don't hear anything because you're muted. No, I, I understand, I understand. So the main issue though, with the immersed boundary method is, you know stuff like, you know force at these Eulerian, at these Lagrangian points, right? But you want force on the Eulerian points to obtain the fluid velocity. So what you do is, and we talked about this last time, you take this Lagrangian point and you basically smear it out over a certain number of grid cells. So here you take two grid cells in each direction and you smear out the force that you would normally get on this Lagrangian point and you do what you call spread to the nearby points. Once you do that, you obtain a force on the blue points. You solve the fluid equations to give you the velocity and then 
you do the reverse. You take this velocity, which is defined on the blue points, and you average it out to give you a velocity of this Lagrangian point. And then you move the Lagrangian point and you iterate. You recompute, okay, it's a rubber band, it's stretched out, it's deformed. What's the force? Spread it to the fluid grid, solve the fluid equations, get the velocity, average it out, move the structure, repeat. Does that make sense? Okay, let me skip that. So here's what a simulation actually looks like um, of an elastic band. So that's this oval. Oops, I'm sorry I keep doing that, I don't mean to. That's this oval. And then what it does is it relaxes into its circular configuration. So here we go, ready? Look at that. And what the, the red is, the orange and blue is the fluid velocity on the grid. So orange means it's positive. So it's going in this direction and blue means it's negative. So the fluid velocity is going in this direction. So that's what's happening. The fluid is moving, is moving the rubber band back to its circular configuration. Now, what would happen if the thing is here, the fluid has no memory. So it doesn't remember where it was a second, or it doesn't remember where it was a second ago. All it sees is, okay, I'm a rubber band, I need to relax. But think about most fluids, right? Think about if you actually put a rubber band in water or when you swim, of course the fluid has memory. If I'm swimming and I start pushing the fluid back, it remembers where it was a second ago because it keeps moving back even after I stop pushing it. That's the difference between Stokes flow, which is how cells feel, how cells swim, and how we swim. We swim at high Reynolds number. When we push fluid, it remembers that it was just being pushed. When cells push fluid, it doesn't remember it was just being pushed. So if a cell, if I go like this in the pool, if I go boom, boom, probably I go forward because the, I push the fluid back and then I start my, moving my hands up, but the fluid is still moving back when I start moving my hands up. If the, do any of you swim? Carolina, do you swim at all? I did water polo before, but never swimming. Okay, did you ever do a, a breaststroke pull out? Yes, right? So that's, this is a breaststroke pull up. You go down and then you go up. And in Stokes flow, that wouldn't do anything because the fluid would go back and then it would stop. And then as soon as you start moving back up, the fluid would go back the other way. And so you would wind up where you start. But in our swimming world, it does. So now, see if you can reason this out. You probably can unless you've seen it. What would happen if you did this test in a high Reynolds number flow? Do you know what happens to the rubber band? I think I might have a movie of this somewhere, but I'm not sure. Let me see if I have, let me, while you're thinking about that, let me see if I have a movie of that. I don't think I do, but I'll check. I do have a movie of it, okay? So what I'm showing you on this slide is the difference between Navier Stokes on the left and Steady Stokes on the right, all right? So let's look at each one in succession. So Steady Stokes is the movie I just showed you. What you see is, and the arrows show the velocity of the thing, okay? So what you see is at the beginning, it starts relaxing. And then once it gets to its final configuration, the velocity goes to zero, the arrows go away. 
And that's what I'm showing you here is the position of this point here. The position of this top point here as a function of time. And that's what these curves are. So if you look at the black, the red curve is the one on the right. So what you see is that it relaxes and then it just stays at zero. The black curve is the one on the left. So look what happens in Navier-Stokes. It starts out like this, right? But then it messes up, it goes too far and it becomes an oval. And now it has to go back. So that's what's happening in this black plot and it oscillates, it goes back and forth, back and forth until finally it smoothly goes to zero. Isn't that nice? So the reason is that the fluid remembers its momentum in Navier-Stokes. In Navier-Stokes, what's happening is when I get to the regular configuration, the fluid still has momentum going this way. So the fluid is still pushing the thing down and up. And then by the time the fluid, by the time the thing starts moving back, or by the time the fluid realizes that it's messed up, the thing is too far in. So then it has to adjust. And that's why you get these oscillations. Does that make sense? So remember, right, when we talk about um, oscillations in ODEs, what kind of words do we use? I'm gonna stop, should I pick up? All right, go ahead, you got the answer? Damping, under damping, right? Okay, there's under damped, over damped, critically damped. All right, so steady stokes, what does that look like to you? Do you remember what, what's under damped? Somebody other than Giancarlo. Uh, Carolina, do you know about this? No, you didn't have ODs. Meng John? No, I plan on taking ODE this summer. Okay, Chella, maybe you know. Do you remember what over damped, under damped looks like, or did you forget? I forgot until I taught ODE. Uh, I'm looking it up right now, actually. Um, it looks like it might be underdamped, the black one. Yeah, that's right. So underdamped is when you get these oscillations. So the oscillations want, the thing wants to go to zero. But what happens is underdamped means it's damped too fast. So it goes to zero too fast, and then it doesn't, it, and then it has to recover. It goes to zero so fast that it goes past zero, it overshoots, and then it has to recover. Overdamped is you never get overshoot, you go right to zero. And actually critically damped would be the minimum amount of time to get to zero, but we don't really know what that is in fluid mechanics. So usually when people talk about steady Stokes equations, they, they talk about the overdamped limit of Navier-Stokes. That's another way to talk about it. Okay, is there anything else in this talk that's interesting? Uh, this was my project from my first, first year as a grad student. This is my, uh, my whole life right here. Okay. All right, so continuing with this. This slide, right? So this stuff was all developed in the 70s. So I put, I put this slide in the presentation and then I presented it. So I, I gave this presentation a couple of times. I gave it at my undergrad uh, like colloquium final, final presentation. Then I gave it at NYU when I first arrived to some of the professors and Charlie was in the audience and like he developed this method and then I showed this picture about how long ago it was. It just wasn't a good book. Right, I basically was calling him old. So probably should have taken it out of the presentation for that one. Okay, so what we wanted to do with the immersed boundary method is understand some of the dynamics of the cell. And so we were motivated by these cellular blebs. Okay, I want you to watch this movie and I want you to tell me what you think is happening. Ready, set. All right, what happened? Carolina, what did you see here? Tell me what you see.
What changes after the flash of white light? Can't hear you. If you don't see, if you don't see anything, that's okay too. You can tell me. I mean, to me, it just that part just expands. Good. That's but... all. I'm looking for. Now, what's happening is, all right, the cell is pressurized. Okay, so think about the inside of the cell being at high pressure. All right. Now. Do you know what direction does stuff flow? Does stuff flow from high pressure to low pressure or from low pressure to high pressure? From higher to lower pressure. Right. It flows from high to lower pressure. That's why the doors on airplanes, they have to open in, right? Did you know this? Probably you did. But if you try to open one of those airplane doors in flight, it's impossible because you want to flow from high pressure to low. So you want to flow outside the airplane. That's why I don't know if you've ever seen a movie of like the airplane window breaks and some guy gets sucked out. It was in some movie. I don't remember what movie it was in, but it was in a movie. Okay. So... The airplane door opens in. So if you try to open that thing in flight, you got to go against that massive pressure gradient. So it's basically impossible to open the door. Now, anyway, my point is what happens here is the cell is under high pressure. Okay. So stuff wants to escape from the cell to go to the low pressure environment outside. And what happens is here, oops. At this point, when the flash of white light happens right there, what happens is that part of the cell right here, it breaks, okay? Part of the membrane actually breaks. And as a result of that, it's actually the cortex that breaks. The thing that's responsible for pressurizing the cell, it breaks. What happens is there's a region of low pressure that forms right where that breakage happens. When that happens, the fluid that's inside the cell flows from high pressure inside of the cell to low pressure outside of the cell or in this little hole here. Such a thing is called a bleb, that thing right there. So it makes a bleb. And these things are useful in uh, cell migration. So the cell migrates sometimes with these blebs. Don't ask me how it happens, I don't actually know. All right. So then what happens is that the, the cortex reforms here under this thing and the pressure restabilizes in the bleb and then the thing kind of contracts, it restabilizes. So you still have this little piece here, but that's the idea. Okay, so I'll just jump through this real quick. The problem is, uh, oh my goodness, this mouse is ridiculous, okay. The problem is that this cell is a surface. It's not just these 1D curves that I talked about. So it's not clear how to make a force, how to figure out what the force is. So you can't just do something times a normal vector. And there's multiple ways to represent a surface. So does anybody know how, if you have a surface, like on a computer, like a surface like this, how is it usually represented? Like in computer graphics? Um, by triangles? Yes. It's usually represented by triangles. So there's a couple ways to represent it. The first way is by triangles. But representing something that's spherical by triangles is kind of like representing a circle by a bunch of little lines. You can do it, and that's how computers actually draw circles, but you know it's a circle. So can we take advantage of the fact that the, sphere, that the cell is basically a sphere? And that's what this project was all about. It was about, can I 
do something with the fact that the cell is a sphere to get a better surface representation. Okay, does that make sense? So I'm gonna skip through most of this stuff because it's too complicated. When I gave the presentation, this is when I lost like all my friends. I had like, I had a lot of friends in college, you know, I was a popular guy and they all came to my presentation and uh, I shouldn't have spent all this time on this because it was like way too technical. And they were all like playing with, uh, you know, playing rock, paper, scissors with each other under the table. Yeah. Anyway, that was back when we had actual presentations, right? That people actually attended in person. So you could tell when they weren't paying attention. Okay, so energy-based methods. If you have a spring, all right, think about a spring. You learned this in like P1 in high school. Maybe. What's the potential energy in a spring? If the spring constant is K and the deformation is X. What's the potential energy? Uh, Meng Zhang, you know? Oh, uh, what? You have a spring. Spring constant is K. Deformation yeah. is X. What's the potential energy? So here's your spring. Okay, it's attached to a wall right here. Here's oh, it's like minus, um, um, it's like uh, minus or plus like uh, one half of k uh, x squared, right? right? The potential energy is one half k x squared and the force, what's the force on the end of the spring that's pulling it back towards its reference state? Um, it's minus k x. Okay. What's the relationship between the potential energy and the force? I'm going to ask somebody else. Carolina, what do you see here? Do you know what the relationship between potential energy and force is? I've learned it, but uh, I forgot. Okay, if you have one half x squared, what's the derivative of that? That's just x. That's right. So what the heck is going on here? Yeah, I lose my mouse. Is my audio? No, no, your audio is fine. It's just that I've like lost my mouse for some reason. It's not working right. It's not working at all, actually. Okay, probably needs to be charged. Now I can't, I can't do anything. I'm sorry, I'm sorry about this. Okay, so connection lost. Yeah, no doubt. So the point is that the force is the negative derivative of the potential energy. Let's see if I can get it back here. Connected. Now, what is it doing? Oh, I'm drawing right here. Okay, good. I got it back. I just, uh, that's what it is. I can't see it. F equals negative D potential energy DX. That's the key relationship. There we go. Clear. Clear all drawing. mouse. Finally. Okay. Thank God. Back to the mouse. Okay. So the point is that the force is the negative derivative of potential energy. So all we have to do is if we write down an energy for the surface and we take its derivative, that's going to give us force. So here's, and this is all just be, this is all just stuff that's not important. Okay. So here's an example, right? You have a triangle that's sitting here. This is like the reference state of the triangle. All right. 
And then you deform that triangle, like when you stretch out the cell, you deform that triangle to a new triangle called T. You can write down an energy that is a function of X and Z. All right, so literally, here's what you do. You take the integral, the energy is an integral over the surface of some function. You take that integral, you change it into triangles, the sum over S of the integral over each triangle of that function, which is now a function of X and Z. And then what happens is you can work out, because these are just triangles, you can work out the integrals analytically. So then what you get is actually because the, these energy densities are constant on the triangle. So you pull them out of the integral, you just have to integrate the area of a triangle analytically, and you do that. So as a result, you get an energy function, which is just sums of the energy on each triangle. And then that energy is a function of X directly. So then you just take its derivative to get force. All right, so each triangle, you write down an energy, you integrate it to get the overall surface energy. Then you differentiate the energy to get force at each point on the triangle. Is that clear? Okay, the details are not that important. Now, there's actually, so this idea is used a lot. This idea of solve equations on triangles, do integrals analytically on triangles. Does anybody know what methods use triangles to solve PDEs? They're called finite element methods. Okay, so this idea is something that's common in what's called finite element methods, which are the most popular method to solve ODEs, PDEs, sorry. All the commercial solvers, ComSol, anybody ever heard of ComSol? No, ANSYS, nothing. All those commercial solvers, like the solvers that the people who work at Chrysler, I have a friend who, I, who actually was my roommate in college, good guy. Uh, I have funny stories about him, but I'll, I'll say this for me. He was a, a mechanical engineer and he went on to work for Chrysler and they do simulations, right? They wanna see how does the fluid flow over the windshield? Can we design the windshield to make the fluid flow more optimal to reduce the drag on the car? Those simulations are carried out with these so-called finite element methods. Okay, so blah, blah, blah. The point here is um, you gotta get, a, you gotta put a lot of triangles to make the surface right. So what we did was we just, we, let's say that you had a circle, right? Forget all this. Let's say that you had a circle, okay, or an ellipsoid, something that looked like this. Let's just consider a circle in 1D, okay? What's the equation of a circle? Let's say that, let's say that the angle around is theta. What's the equation, the parametric equation of a circle? X equals something theta, Y equals something theta. Do you remember? There's stuff in the chat, but I'm not looking at the chat, sorry. Um, Giancarlo, do you know what the equation of a circle is? Yeah, X squared plus Y squared is equal to R squared. Good, all right. But what about a parametric equation? Have you ever heard it said as X equals cosine theta, Y equals sine theta? Yeah, but with the R, right? Yeah, R, R cosine theta, R sine theta, right? Yeah. So just like that, you can represent an ellipse, ellipsoid in 3D, cosine of lambda times cosine theta, sine lambda cosine theta, sine theta. You just have two parameters now because you're, you have a 2D surface, but of course, it doesn't always stay in ellipsoid. So what you do is you basically introduce a series of functions, which are like, for example, for a circle in 2D, you would just do cosines and sines. 
So you can describe your any shape because it's uh, periodic. You can describe any shape of a curve in 2D, a closed curve in terms of cosines and sines. So we're doing basically the same thing in 3D. We describe this curve in terms of cosines and sines. And then what we do is we write down the energy as a continuous function. And instead of breaking it up into triangles, we just differentiate the continuous function with respect to lambda and theta to get the force. And the derivation is super complicated and it's, not, it's actually not very fun. But um, this method, to be honest with you, it's, it's a pain and there's not that many advantages over the triangle method. So, but however, there are advantages if you consider a flat rectangular sheet instead of a, a closed surface. Because in a flat rectangular sheet, you can represent everything in each direction in terms of cosines and sines, Fourier modes. And, and that makes things a lot easier because derivatives like this, right? Derivatives on this surface are pretty complicated, but derivatives in Fourier space, like when you have a flat sheet, are just multiplication in Fourier space. We talked about that a million times. So the point is that this whole complicated equation becomes a lot simpler if you're on a flat sheet. But on a surface, it's not simple. So does anybody know what a convergence plot is? Giancarlo, you know what it is, you've made them. You know, when, remember when you plotted in that coding homework, delta T on one axis and on the other axis, you plotted the air? That's a convergence plot. Okay, so this guy, right? This guy is like this famous mathematician at California. His name is James Sethi. And I went to a talk by him and he said about these plots, he said, Nobody wants to see them, like look at them because they're not visually appealing. But everyone wants to know that you checked them, that you did them. So he's, he's like, so we did them. And then he goes, next slide. And on his slides, the convergence plots were like this big, like this was one of them, it was like in this corner. So he goes, we did them, click, next slide. So the point of these convergence plots, okay, is to show that if you want to calculate the force on a surface, our method is a lot better than the triangle method. So here's an example, right? I put 8,000 triangles here. And this is how much, this is the accuracy I got. Just look at the red. That red is how much accurate I got in the force. All right. And then in our method, M is the number of points. So I put 14 squared, I put 200 something points, that's 196 points. I got an accuracy of 10 to the minus 13. Fantastic, right? I got way better. But the problem is, and Mengjia might be, in, you might be interested in this. The problem is that when you actually look at the convergence plots of the trajectory, so you look at now the dynamic air, you pick a point on the surface and you look at how it's moving as a function of time and how does that converge with the number of points on the surface, the size of the fluid grid and the size of the fluid grid, you get similar errors for the, the, the circles and the blue is the triangles and the squares is our method. You get similar errors. And the reason is because this calculation, the calculation to take the force, smear it out on the grid, solve the fluid equations, average that and get the velocity back on the fluid. That calculation is so inaccurate that it doesn't matter how accurate you compute the force on the structure. So this plot was just the force on the structure. It doesn't matter how accurately you compute it, you still get the same error for the evolution because this step is so bad. Does that make sense? Mengjian, does that make sense? Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you want to ask So me? because the delta function is bad, so you cannot like, um, so you cannot kind of like 
avoid this numerical error by like improving the other um, parts, right? You can't get around the bad delta function. The delta function is going to give you first order accuracy no matter what. And the reason is because in the cell that I told you is pressurized, right? So there's a pressure jump across the interface. So you're trying to approximate something that's discontinuous with a smooth function. And so as a result, all you get is first order accuracy, no matter how accurate you, no matter how many grid points you put. But there are ways to get higher order accuracy by accounting for those jumps. And those are called immersed interface methods. And if you read one of those papers, you will want to throw up by the time you finish reading it. Because it's so complicated and, and so hard to follow. There's all these jump conditions and they have to add this and oh, it's a complete and total disaster. So I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. And that's why I stopped using these methods because they're a huge pain. Okay, but immersed boundary method, by the way, the thing about the immersed boundary method it is the only method, in my opinion, in most mathematicians' opinion, it's the best method for Navier-Stokes. So if you don't have a way to solve the equation analytically, like we do for cells, if you have a guy swimming in the pool, it's really a great method because first order is about the best you can do without going to some incredibly nasty finite element method. Okay, so this guy, so when I was making this presentation, I had just finished touring grad schools. So I met all these people on my travels and I put their quotes in the PowerPoint. So this guy, he told me, does anybody know who Mike Shelley is? He's a professor at Quran. Yeah, yeah. So this guy was his student like back in 2000 something, 2006. Nice guy. Uh, he told me, I don't like to write a numerical method, make convergence, make a bunch of convergence plots, and then not apply it to anything. Okay, so that's what I did so far. I didn't apply the method to anything. So now I'm going to apply it to the Blevin model. So I take the membrane and I represent it using these cosine and sine functions. And I, then I also compare it to representing it using triangles. And what I do is, right, when I simulate this Blevin process, I take these springs, so I set up a cortex here in green. I attach it to the membrane by these springs here. I don't do this, my advisor did this. And then I break some of the springs in this red circle part. And we talked about what happens. Now, what happens is you break the springs and then there's a pressure release and then the fluid rushes in. Okay. So here's a video of it. See how the bleb pops out, just like in the movie? But the thing is that the bleb is not as sharp as it is in the movie. In the movie, it looked like a bubble. Here, it just looks like a dimple or a pimple. And you get a nicer, more bubble-looking bleb if you look at tri the triangle method. So this is one that is like bu more bubular. This one is with triangles. And what the reason is, that the triangles are a discontinuous representation. So this triangle over here doesn't care about the triangles up here. But when I represent it, when I represent my surface in terms of cosines and sines, the cosine is defined everywhere. It's defined along the entire surface. So when I try to fit my surface with cosines and sines, the fit cares just as much as the about the value here as it does about the value here. So it's trying to take a non-smooth problem, which is this bleb, and fit it with smooth functions, cosines and sines. So it doesn't really work. Does that make sense? Or no? Please ask questions if it's confusing. So there's, there's what this is. It's trying to ram a square peg which is cosines and sines into a round hole, which is discontinuous uh, surface. 
Is that making sense? There's me with my hammer. This is all the stuff I tried before, apparently. Okay, so then just to satisfy ourselves and to satisfy our viewers, we applied it to a red blood cell in a tube. So for that one, the shape of the cell is really smooth. And so you get these nice, forget about this, you get these nice looking shapes when you have a, a red blood cell with our method because it's able to resolve these smooth surfaces. This one is when you, when you don't give the cell a bending energy, you get these wrinkles. And then here we gave it a little bending energy. So we, we penalized it if it wrinkled and then it's got smooth. Okay, this was, oh, this is something cool about uh, Mike Shelley's work and his postdoc. I thought I was gonna work with them when I came here, but I decided not to. But anyway, what they do is they do this kind of stuff, but they do it in a cell and the cell has these microtubules sticking out of them. And um, they have like a, a rigid nucleus of the cell here in the middle and they simulate how the nucleus aligns at the equator right before division. This is a different kind of cell. This is a cell of, of uh, worms, C. elegans. And in that one, the nucleus lines up at the middle before division. There's not this like chromosome stuff that you learn in, in bio for human cells. So I'm done. I hope, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Um, questions? Uh, before we take questions, let me go ahead and uh, end the recording uh, right after I announce the next session, uh, which is going to be April 28th. That's another Wednesday, 6 p.m. again. Uh, and that will be our final session, so make sure to be here for that.